first question would be, Corey, as an as a elder or Shane, what do you think about this? Communion with the Church of the Firstborn is your right and your key to this mystery. I, I don't see it that way. I just... <laughs> Or how many, I should say, how many of our Melchizedek Christian members or on the LDS side, they would say they're, they're apostles or they're prophets who are considered prophets. How many of them have had this experience or have shared this experience in public of communing with the church of the firstborn and God the Father and Jesus? You know, even within the last year or two, I've got a copy of email sent out to the restoration branches at large with a reminder of the ones in charge. Hey. Remember, we have the keys to all spiritual blessings of the church, and they're asking for support as they as they make their pilgrimage to Kirtland to receive the word of God and to worship God. And to say that this isn't affecting our culture uh, yeah. would, would just be a huge and in, incorrect statement. It's absolutely a part of everything we believe in. Yeah, I think the biggest danger in the whole the whole Enoch story is the fact that it puts so much emphasis on what I can do. You know, it's, it's about works and I mean, we don't really, we don't say that openly, but you know, when thy posterity shall look what upwards and embrace the truth, then shall Zion look downwards. And if then f- formula that starts with me, I have to bring about Zion, mm-hmm. you know? Right. And so, it, and it, it, that's not a power that I have. The only power that I have is to repent. Oh, if you, if you start putting the, the onus of everything on ourselves, then we we're gonna we're just gonna fail. We're just gonna have failure, and Satan's gonna laugh. Well, know? when 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 the scripture when men shall keep all my commandments, then shall Zion again come on the earth. Shane, what are you doing in your life to prevent Zion? Obviously, you're right. not keeping all the commandments because I am, and so it's waiting on you. And so <laughs> right. you see, right? You see the you see the um, who has authority and who's not doing things right, and what do we need to get back to? That's right. We have to do all these things perfect so that Zion can come, and it's all about us and and. God's waiting on us, and it's just its a flipping of the story. Um, Zion will come whether Mike Barrett learns how to keep all the commandments or not, right? Welcome back to Restored Gospel Podcast. I'm Mike Barrett here with my friends, Shane Robinson and Corey Stark, finishing up or continuing on, I should say, our series on A Tale of Two Zions. Got a little fire here this morning. I thought, uh, Corey, if we start out a round of Silent Night, you can start. We'll let Shane sing alto, maybe <laughs> go in and then uh, I'll pick up the end with soprano. So to start us off whenever you feel I can give you a C. So. Mm. <laughs> Silent night. We, we just that lost my like baritone. Five, <laughs> we just lost like five hundred subscriptions right I there. So. <laughs> All right, good to be back. We have a warm fire here. It's uh, getting colder, and we're moving towards the Christmas season. Corey, I'm just going to let you take it away. Well, this is part five on the tale of two Zions, and thanks for having us back, Mike. We've discussed some scriptures, and this is a quick list, uh, RLDS and LDS references. Um, We do appreciate if anyone's listening on the podcast, know that you can go to YouTube, search Restored Gospel Podcast, and you can watch this event as well. But um, we've talked about many of these scriptures, and today I want to focus on this last one, Mormon chapter two, or it's Mormon five in the LDS they all tell somewhat about zion and the problem is that it conflicts with the traditional teaching of zion in the restoration this this is the main bullet point really the story of zion is a promise to restore the house of israel via the covenant with abraham the covenant of abraham has sadly been overlooked and i'm going to focus on that a little bit today but jesus is the one who teaches this covenant with abraham it's mentioned throughout the book of mormon why we don't discuss it, it remains to be understood. But Jesus tells the people in Nephi's day, or, or when he visits in person, the Nephites, you are of the covenant which the father made with your fathers, saying unto Abraham, in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. 
So the Nephites were a part of this covenant with Abraham. And he, he goes on to explain the facets of the covenant. Some of them are with the Jews. Some of them are with the remnant. And even some of them are with us, the Gentiles. And I just pull this one up because he states that this mighty blessing we've had that's made us mighty as a people, of, individually, as a nation, has been part of this covenant with Abraham that God would pour the Holy Ghost out upon the Gentiles, us, which blessing would make us mighty above all. And that would even result in the scattering of Israel and being a scourge to the people of this land. Now, that's not the end of the story, but it's interesting that that's all part of the Abrahamic covenant. Um, the Book of Mormon makes no mention of Enoch, and we were talking off air a little bit about this. Everything that we teach about Enoch comes from extra scriptural sources, things that were outside of the original text of the Bible. Now, that's debatable what was the original text, but <clears throat> we were given the Book of Mormon so we wouldn't stumble. And notice that Lehi, Nephi, Jacob, King Benjamin, Jesus, Mormon, Moroni, Ether, they all had their chance, so to speak, in talking about history, but no, none of them ever mentioned Enoch. I just, that gives me pause. I, I ask the question, okay, so why do we focus on it so much if they never mentioned it? So also the Jaredites, they even mention in their record, you know, well, actually Moroni mentions that the Jaredite record covers the creation of the world, but he said, but that story's had among the Jews, so I'm not even gonna mention it here. Hey, Corey. Yeah. So I was thinking about that second bullet point. So it, they never mentioned Enoch. So then I was thinking in my mind, well, who did they mention? You know, to show that they did refer to the past. And I was thinking about all the references, like, of course, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Isaiah, um, Jeremiah. Um, who, can you think, I, I we obviously didn't prepare for this ahead of time, but can you think of anything off, any others offhand that, that there are mentioned in the, in the Book of Mormon? Well, Zenoch and Zenos, which, which we don't have their records, but they're quoted as pro prolific writers in their knowledge of Jesus. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. All that comes from the brass plates. And there's a mention that the Bible would be smaller than the brass plates. So who who knows of all the other writers they potentially had that, that we don't have? But that's a good point. You know, they, they mention all these others. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking in terms of, well, what if they just weren't into mentioning past prophets? But but we obviously they were. So True. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. And there's we'll get to this a little bit later. But, you know, the brother Jared was told that no one had faith like him who, to come to Jesus and, and to see him like he did. And it's that's a major disparity if you compare that to the Enoch story, because Enoch, if if you follow it, happened before the brother of Jared. And so Jesus tells the brother of Jared, hey, no one's ever come to me in faith like you have. That's why you're seeing me. And if you take that for what it's saying, it's like, well, then did Jesus happen to forget about Enoch then? Because he's telling the brother Jared, you know, you're kind of the guy here uh, with, with the faith. Enoch that's, seemed to have, have a lot of faith. Yeah, that's a hinge point. That's a very, uh, that's something that I've, there's really no way around other people try to use apologetics to get out of that. But I just, with the, the way the book of Mormon is and nature of it, how plain it is, if God says no one's had faith or seen me like, like this experience with Jared, that I think that's just a real good nugget that we should latch on to you. And just a bit of truth that gives us some solid foundation in looking at these kind of things in history. I mean, why, You'd have to say, like you said, Jesus forgot it or he was just telling a fib because, I mean. Yeah. And the, the specific wording says no one has ever come to me like you have in faith. Um, you can maybe read that different ways, but I, I kind of feel like if it, if the Enoch story was true, he said, hey, you came to me like Enoch did, you know, and it's like, no, he, he doesn't say it that way. But I. I and that all gives me reason to say we need to take a step back and not be distracted by things that may not have actually been of God or scriptural. And I think we've been taken in by that. Every Gentile Christian group has been to some extent. We follow traditions versus the truth. So I'm trying to peel some of that back. But, um, you know, and again, I kind of I have to ask this question. If Enoch's story is so vital to God's plan, especially for us Gentiles, why didn't Lehi or Ether ever explain it in the writings? And obviously they didn't. So the Enoch 
a covenant with Enoch, the city of Enoch, the promise for Enoch city return. No Book of Mormon writers mention any of it. That to me is telling. So Enoch was popular among the Freemasons in Joseph Smith's day. And I know you guys have done some research and I'm not going to present it all, but feel free to, to jump in with any facts or information. You know, I can't prove this, but it seems to me that um, just as the time Joseph Smith is bringing this new information from the Book of Mormon to the world, you know, people close to him, he was surrounded by Freemasons. It seems likely that other people were saying, well, hey, here's new information. And I think, Shane, you just said something about some of this Enoch information coming forth in 1821. Was that was that what you were quoting? Yeah, the Book of Enoch was first published in English in 1821. Yeah, yeah. And so in the Freemason world, swirling around Joseph at the same time was all this information about Enoch at, at different levels. Now, Enoch was sort of the Indiana Jones of the 1800s. You know, and this is a quote from a Freemason book. Uh, God transported Enoch to an arched vault deep underground where he saw the engraved uh, the name engraved on a golden tablet. Enoch had a lavish temple built above the vault and sealed the underground chamber with a heavy iron trap door so that it would survive the coming flood, after which no one knew of the true name. Centuries later, Solomon dispatched three masons in search of the ruin, uh, in the ruins materials to embellish his own edifice. In the Masonic legend, they find the trap door and despite their trepidation, descend into the darkness of the vault to find the golden tablet, which glows like the sun. I mean, and here's where this is quoted from. But the, the point is, people's minds were swirling with this adventure. And, you know, Enoch was this guy with, you know, laser eyes and who could transport himself out of this world. And, you know, this incredible legend. And and then you've got these, you know, Templar knights, like they were searching for the ruins and finding these secrets. It was all this story of adventure, but none of it was biblical. And I, again, I can't prove it, but it seems that Joseph may have been persuaded by these things. I mean, and I say I can't prove it. I can't prove what Joseph read or didn't read. And and I'm not trying to be a critic of Joseph Smith. I, I'm just saying, you know, factually, these stories were out there. Some critics of all the restoration will point to every book that's ever been published anywhere in the world and see, say, see, it existed in Joseph's time. Therefore, he was influenced by it. Well, that's not really a proof. It, it may be some kind of a correlation, but it's it's not necessarily a causation. Um, however, this is what I think is interesting. And and I just want to share one, one document. Uh, a guy named uh, James Bruce um, comes back from Ethiopia and Africa where he's been searching the Nile. And this guy is a Mason, Freemason. He lives in the 1700s and he finds some documents in Ethiopian language. It was the Coptic language, but there were Christians who lived in Ethiopia and they had writings and he has these translated. Now, what's interesting to me is when I came across this a couple of years ago, I, I had also found that these hadn't been translated into English until the early 1900s, which led me to believe, hey, this document supports what Joseph Smith's saying. Well, I've come since to find out that no, James Bruce, the Freemason, had these translated immediately upon returning to Scotland. And with that, the knowledge started transferring around the world. And so this one document is called the Kebra Nagast. That's this word. Uh, and I was a, it was something from 700 years ago, you know, like the 1400s, 1300s, when it was written. Again, it wasn't written in Jesus' day. It was written by Christians after. But this is what's interesting to me. If you look at some of the Kebra Nagas, now it's 100 pages or so. I'm just pulling out a couple excerpts. This is what's interesting to me. If you compare it to the inspired version of the Bible, not the King James, the inspired version, it says, for instance, I swear by myself and by Zion, the tabernacle of my covenant. These, these colors here are are kind of so you can tie in the different language which i've created for a mercy seat for the salvation of men and in the latter day i will make to come down to thy seed that i have pleasure in the offerings of thy children and the, the tabernacle of my covenant will be with them forever well when you look at what was inserted in genesis now i don't know if joseph smith intended for it to be inserted in genesis but the two committees who came after him that actually assembled the inspired version they 
put this in Genesis as if to say, okay, this was the time frame after Adam, before Abraham and Moses. But nevertheless, the language is very similar. It's almost eerie. Even so, I will come in the last days. You know, you get this mention of the last days to make a covenant, you know, concerning the children of Noah um, to come down to thy seed. Uh, there will be my tabernacle. It should be called Zion. Here's the tabernacle, my covenant. Here it is in the ninth chapter of, I, of the inspired version. I will establish my covenant with you, which I've made to Enoch. My covenant will be with them forever. And here and have shall place shall have place until the end come. Um, just trying to rush through here, maybe a little bit too fast. But you start seeing these phrases that match. And, and here's more. You know, I thought when, I was a, I'm going to stop you just for a second when yep. you're referring to the tabernacle. I've I've been um, a bit intrigued by the idea of temple and where did Joseph Smith all of a sudden um, get this idea of there being a temple attached to a part of our church culture and doctrine? Uh, you know, er, as early as 1830 or 1831, uh, when they were going to go take the gospel to the Lamanites, they published a covenant that was printed in the paper and it was talking about uh you know bringing the understanding of temple and zion to the to the lamanites and so very early on i know it's, it's really odd when you bring up uh the kirtland temple i don't know why but almost every time someone will make a comment well joseph never referred to it as the temple early on and i don't know where that comes from or if, if that's some type of apologetic for joseph um I'm not sure because he was definitely give revelation about the temple and independence. Um, and in 1830, the idea of a temple, whether or not they actually said that of the Kirtland temple or not, it, we we've added that name, but I don't think that matters as much as the purpose and the concept of why this building to hold special ordinances. And I just can't figure out how this popped up as early as 1830 in the paper and that they thought this was part of the gospel that they were going to share with the Lamanites. And here's maybe, if we're looking at this Kebra Nagast and kind of the pop culture of the time, and Enoch being kind of a, a fun topic to kick around with different ideas, perhaps, the, and this is speculation, but the, here is a source that does talk about temples in the last days. Because I, yeah. I just don't make the... Uh, the connection that once Jesus died and the veil was rent in the temple and, and God had it destroyed and knocked down, there's so much symbolism there. Where did this notion come to put it back in? And, and now we'll talk maybe later about our culture and how we've internalized that. That's a good point. And I hadn't seen that, but you're right. It does bring back this idea of temple and the, the Freemasons. I, I'm not one. Um, I actually, a little known fact is my, my dad was, before he got married, um, my my dad has an interesting story and background, but his um, his association with that took him to a pretty high level. And once he met my mom and kind of she told him more about Christianity and the restoration stuff, he he walked away from all that. But um, he never ever mentioned it once in my life that I know of. But um, I think he was like really high. Like I think you can go up to thirty three degrees, and I heard the number thirty two associated with him. So, um, but these notions came to us from other people and you're right. Why would you need a temple if the purpose of the temple was to perform these blood sacrifices? Um, Jesus fulfilled all that. It seems like it's a notion. It's a tradition that's tagged along with us, but, um, well, yeah, go ahead. Also, Shane. I was just going to say one of the, one of the dangers in, in this kind of thing is, so we've got this laid down as fact. It's in our book of scriptures, what we consider scriptures. And so when we when we have that as our foundation and then we read these other sort of, you know, um, questionable documents, if they say anything that matches what our narrative is, we automatically assume it's true. Yes. Yeah. So book of book of Enoch, you know, mentions this, some of this stuff. And so we think, oh, well, it's, it's from God because it you know talks about Jesus a little bit talks about Enoch, it talks about, you know, so these are, we use these as confirmations, but we've got it out of order because we're going in with a false pretext yep. and, you know, or at least a questionable pretext. So I, I think we have to, I think that's why the Book of Mormon is so precious because it lays down a baseline that we can trust, um, you know, and of course, obviously everything has to be read with the spirit, but, um, you know, I just, I, you know, it's funny because the other day I was, I was, you know, I have a guilty, uh, 
a, a guilty admission that sometimes I'll watch ancient aliens, <laughs> which is this, you know, this dumb documentary on history channel about, about ancient aliens, which, yeah, I don't believe any of it, but sometimes there's little nuggets that I, I find interesting from the history. And, um, they were talking about the pyramids that they, that they believe they were built by, by Enoch, by this ancient character, Enoch. And they had all this reasons why and all this. And, and I sit there thinking, okay, so if I was to, if I was to totally embrace what I grew up with without question, without any kind of, you know, prayer about it, logical thought or anything, just, just totally embrace it. I would say that the ancient alien show is being led by the Holy spirit to discover this truth about Enoch. And then I would implant that new idea into my theology that, Oh, well, Enoch built the pyramids. Right. You know, and I, and that's what I think we've done that. We just layer upon layer upon layer over the centuries. And, and here we are, you know, you know, it's the same true as that, you know, somehow everyone in the restoration has on the surface wanted to shun Freemasonry and say, Hey, there wasn't any influence. But the thing is, if you hold to the Enoch story and the restoration, well, you have to give some credence to the Freemasons and say, well, they discovered him. They discovered him before Joseph Smith did. So does that mean everything that the Freemasons did and said about Enoch was right? And it's like, then we want to pick and choose. And they say, no, only the things that Joseph Smith said were right. But it's like, you can't do that. It's like, you got to take one or the other. But anyhow, there's there's influences. You know, you see this back here in this Cabernet Nagas the language of it is what kind of just haunts me a little bit. The the cloud that appeared in the sky so that they may not fear and imagine that a flood is coming. You know, when I bring the, and then the inspired version says, when I bring a cloud over the earth, I'll see the bow in the cloud. You know, this bow of the covenant is mentioned. Part of this is just historical of the flood. But then when he's talking about this flood to destroy the earth, then he's like, I will remember the tabernacle of my covenant. That's what you're pointing out, Mike and Shane. You know, this, this dwelling place, this temple, and I'm going to set the rainbow in the sky, and I'm going to turn away my anger and send my compassion. You know, And then what does the inspired verse say? I'm going to remember the everlasting covenant that I made with my father Enoch. And, and when we get a little farther on here, then you see where Enoch's name comes in. There's some direct wording in the New Testament that comes just this heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Um, and that reads also the same way in the King James, which means that the Kebra Nagast was borrowing from New Testament writers. But but then you get this, the general assembly of the church of the firstborn and my everlasting covenant that I made with Enoch. You know, then in Kebra Nagast, Enoch, Elias shall come and... and uh, Moses and Aaron and all the dead are going to live with everyone. This is this general assembly of the church of the firstborn. This, this language is even incorrect because I've heard men in our own day talk about the church of the firstborn and they assume <clears throat> firstborn means the first earthlings, first humans to be born, you know, like the church back in those days. That isn't it at all. The firstborn is incorrectly applied here because the church of the firstborn meant the church of jesus he was the firstborn and and so we don't even understand the language but we just you know ascend to it and feel like oh man this is holy writing but it's like it's it's even incorrectly used so this church of jesus is the church of the firstborn so coming down out of heaven to possess the earth have place until the end come that's what this is saying enoch elias everyone's going to come they're gonna, all going to be alive forever um and and this is going to be Zion that's going to come and it's going to be prepared and appear. Here's I, just, a, I, just, I was just going to say, I just see these <clears throat> things and it just haunts me. It's like, eh, I don't think this is right. Well, you see the Kebra Nagast. I, I see a, a timeline being um, twisted according to the Book of Mormon, where it talks about the tabernacle of the law of God. The holy Zion shall remain there until that day when our Lord shall dwell on Mount Zion. And we know the Book of Mormon talks about... Um, Christ being here with us and then the commencement of, of the gathering of all the tribes. And so it's a flip of the timeline. Um, and that's very much acclimated into our idea still that we need to build the temple so that the Lord can return. Um, and so just playing Mr. Contrary, uh, you know, you could say what Joseph Smith was receiving from God and that this Kebra Nagast is a is uh, also from the Lord, and, and Joseph's clarifying it, so it gives credence to the fact that, that the inspired version is of the Lord. Um, but looking at 
source material, things I've learned from hemlock knots and researching, the closer a source is to the time it happened, the more the more uh, reliable it is. And so if these things, the earliest book of Enoch, which wasn't written by Enoch, it was written by someone else about him. If that earliest source is several hundred years after Christ, and it's talking about things that happened thousands of years before, then you have to question if it's even a legitimate source or not, or if it's just, you know, someone somewhere is, is adding to something and making it up. Um, you know, there's a interesting little tidbit of history. It was just sort of a blip and it was gone. But after Joseph Smith's day, there was a guy, well, he, I think his name was Schofield in, in church history, who ends up saying that he's had these revelations about the book of Esdras. And Esdras is another one of these apocryphal writers. Uh, and he's also quoting Enoch and, and Esdras. And he's got this revelation that people are supposed to gather, which they do. He gets a, a community of people together in Iowa. And then he's given this revelation that the world's going to be destroyed and they're going to find safety in California. So he ends up encouraging a few people to go to California. And it's interesting because that happened in about 1948 and the gold rush was in 1949. But this guy fizzles out and, you know, people leave and they die off and this guy's kind of gone. But it all seemed pretty legit because this guy is also quoting Enoch. And it's like, where does this stuff stop? And in the end, the real point is it should have never started. It, these these conversations get people caught up in the wrong things forever. And saints are probably the most gullible for that because we want to believe these things are true. And, and what we reject instead is the truth that already came to us, you know, in the Book of Mormon, the, the words that we already have. Can can you put that document, that page you just were on, put that back up? Yeah. This one? No, the one. Yeah. This one? Yeah. That one. Yeah. So just, and I know we're not saying the cover of Nagas is scripture or anything like that, but it's interesting, um, the the misunderstanding of who Jesus is and that, that highlighted part that's yellow there. Yeah. You know, it, it says the tabernacle of the law of God. Well, the tabernacle, according to the Book of Mormon, is Christ. He was the yes. tabernacle of clay, right? And and he is the law. He completes the law. So they're talking about it as, as if it's something separate, you know, and, and that it's like they don't know who Jesus is, is if you're if you're you know, in their reading yes yeah as we're hearing this point to make this relevant i think at the end i'd like each one of us to share our, just our personal thought on why this is important to to look at whether this is truly scripture or or something that was just added to the bible i find this very relevant because i think all of this ties in again to who joseph smith was uh when John Tandy was on here and, and we were talking about the inspired version and both stated that, you know, there's only one source and that's through Joseph. So if, if when we're talking about this story in Genesis, what we're talking about is the man, Joseph Smith and his role in the restoration. And if some of these things um, were just like the book of Abraham, a figment of his imagination, then we have to look at, what did that do to our culture as a church and how did it affect it? And I think there's a good line running through all of that, that we see that a false tale was sown that has led to a lot of uh, sadness and um, divisiveness in our church where we're at right now. All these things bring shame to the truth and they cover it. They distract us from mm -hmm. it. And, and what we need is to come back to it. And the truth is the Book of Mormon. Right. So other than the cover the grass is scripture or not, certainly some ideas that are here are no doubt within our culture as far as building a temple in the dedicated spot for the Lord to return to. So how did yeah. that transpose, you know? In, in a larger sense, you know, people didn't have photocopiers. People didn't have iPhone cameras, take pictures of documents and email them to their friends. They had scribes and scribes weren't even professional people initially. What's interesting is that in the days of the original apostles, scribes were sometimes just the housewives who they were asked, hey, I've got this letter, can you copy it? And there wasn't any scrutiny to it. There wasn't any, there weren't rules and regulations dictating how they had to do it. They just tried their best and they made a lot of errors. And then scribes would get copies and, and the Bible that we have, the New Testament, I said this off air, has more changes to it by scribes than there are words in the New Testament. I mean, you think about that for a minute. It's like there's tens of thousands of changes. And so 
we aren't given to know what things were changed necessarily because we don't have the original documents. None of the Bible was created from the original texts. Now there are people who will, you know, get huffy and imply somehow that the King James is the original. It's like, you know, I'm sorry, but that's not true. But they'll they'll stand behind it. It becomes the hill they want to die on. And and this is not what God gave us either. He didn't say, I'm going to sort this Bible out for you. And again, this is another question. Why did Joseph feel it was upon him to make any changes at all? Because things that I've learned in this book called Mis Misquoting Jesus that are in the Bible, in the New Testament, this uh, PhD evangelical scholar who wrote this book goes through and shows several passages that are prominent passages in the New Testament that he says, these were mistakes. These were added by scribes later, and yet we rely on them today. Well, why didn't Joseph take those out if if he was putting the Bible back to normal? You know, it's like it, the inspired version doesn't answer those questions. It just leaves us hanging. So I come back to this that no, what we were given was the Book of Mormon so we could understand these things. So it's incumbent upon us to study it. Well, and I think it's important to mention, I know we've mentioned this before, but for anybody that's a new listener, um, <clears throat> you know, the inspired version or the Joseph Smith translation, you know, I grew up my whole life believing that Emma had the manuscript, you know, the entire complete manuscript, you know, in her in her petticoat or whatever and crossed the frozen, you know, um, Mississippi River and all that. I mean, I, I grew up with that story. And so I assumed that when the inspired version was published, you know, printed, that it was just word for word what she was carrying in her dress, you know. Um, and, and if you do the research on it, you find out that that's not the case, that, right. the, that the inspired version was multiple sources. Um, some of them were things Joseph had said. Some of them were were from his personal Bible that he just wrote some notes in the columns. I mean, you could pull my Bible out today, and I have notes in there that I've written in the column that I now don't agree with. Yes. You know, I mean, they're just they're just your thoughts in that moment. You know, so we're holding this man on such a high pedestal that just his random thoughts that he writes in his Bible becomes our scripture. That's a yeah. problem. That's a problem. Yeah. That's huge. Um, and, yeah. And so, and so, you know, and not to throw any, not to throw negative light on, on this, but we need to be realistic about it. This, this book, the inspired version, J Joseph Smith translation, whatever you call it, is basically a, a, a Joseph Smith commentary on the Bible and it yes. needs to be viewed as such. It should have been called a commentary. And it's then a, it, right. Well, it's important also though, to, to not, uh, to understand what, he thought about what he was doing. And I think the intention was, or, or the thought process, at least from what's recorded is they did view it as a inspired correction of the Bible, uh, in church history. You know, they would talk about resuming our work on the inspired translation. Or I'm not sure the exact word, but resumed our work on the, on the Bible. Uh, it was something that was started early as soon as the book of Mormon was out. So not, I think the intention there, the thought process was we are getting a more divine, direct revelation of what the Bible is, but he had no say over what was finally published. But um, I don't think they viewed it so much as a commentary, as a divine, divinely corrected book. So I'm not sure, just I'm going from memory what I've read in church history and some of the revelations surrounding it. Yeah, and, and the problem is those ideas that were put into the book all reinforce the traditions that came early in, in the 1830s. And so we assume it all to be true. And it's like, we have to come back and say, okay, what things are actually true and what things are tradition? And that's where I like to draw the line to separate that. But this is important too. We, I hear from a lot of LDS that they're, even some of them are going, you know, to the Joseph Smith translation as a, a good resource. And, and those that are maybe stepping out of the LDS religion uh, still, um, really connected to the inspired version or what did joseph smith say in his translation and so i think this is a good discussion that coming from that side being able to access the joseph smith translation um just to keep in mind this may not be you know the healthiest of things when looking at what the word really says or yeah yeah and like even this keber nagas document while these things seem similar to the restoration stories that we tell about enoch and everything there's a lot in there that disagrees with what the Book of Mormon teaches. So it's like, do you take parts of it or do you take it as a whole? It's like, you know, here, here's a couple things. The Book of Mormon teaches that God has not forgotten his people, the Jews, but the Keber Nagast condemns the Jews. And here's an example of it. These are other places in the same Keber Nagast document. Um, 
after, after the Jews crucified the Savior of the world, they were scattered abroad and their kingdom was destroyed, and they were made an end of and rooted out forever and ever. And then later it says, uh, he shall judge the living and the dead and reward every man according to his work. So that therefore, when the Jews shall see him, they shall be put to shame and shall be condemned to the fire, which is everlasting. So the Jews condemned to fire everlasting. But we who believe in the Orthodox faith shall be upon our throne and we shall rejoice with our teachers, the apostles. This is <laughs> I, I probably can't say enough about it, and I'm really not going to say much, but this is the whole attitude that the Catholic Church took, was that somehow the, the apostles of the Catholic Church became more superior to the written word, and that they should rely on them instead. And so this is a total teaching of the Gentiles, that the Gentiles are going to be promoted over the Jews. This is all from the Kebron de Gas. That clearly is in conflict with the Book of Mormon, which when you come back to Abraham's covenant teaches God hasn't forgotten his people, Jews and Gentiles will be blessed in Christ. So I, I look at this saying, how can we hold on to this? And these ideas seem to have influenced the writings of Joseph Smith. I, there could be other places that came from, I'm just showing one example, but this was part of Freemasonry. All right. And it seems to be part of Genesis chapter nine in the inspired version. So my summary on this, and I know there's a lot more I could say, but that the restoration version of Enoch and Zion distract us from the real covenant with Abraham. And that's what truly foretells about Zion, right? That's what, where the Book of Mormon comes in. Um, one of the things about our early saints that they had wrong is that Zion comes after Israel is scattered and regathered. And this is just a couple examples. There's a lot of language in the Book of Mormon about the scattering of Israel. And when I say Israel, I mean the Jews, you know, in Jerusalem. We saw them and their scattering. We also witnessed a Holocaust, but the scattering of Joseph's remnant, they actually had an even bigger Holocaust. It's really not recorded in history. It's it's sort of washed under the rug, but more more people of the house of Joseph in America died under the Holocaust put forth on them when the Spaniards came than Jews who died in Germany in, in Hitler's concentration camps by a factor of maybe, um, oh, it depends on who you read, but 10 to maybe 50 times as many people died. They aren't sure exactly how many people lived, but people died by the millions in sometimes through um, fighting and conquest and sometimes simply through the disease that came when the Europeans landed here. I read of places where there was over like uh, 1.5 million people just living in the area, a size of like a county that we would have today. And in the end, less than a hundred people were alive after just a couple of years, a lot of them dying through disease. So tremendous loss of life, tremendous I, I, scattering of Israel. Yeah. I read that. Uh, I believe it was, I'm quoting off the top of my head here, but I think it was 90% of the population. They think that up to 90% of the population was, was wiped out mostly due to smallpox. Yep. And we, yep. and we were get that we were giving them blankets with smallpox to yep. spread the disease. Yep. And, and it was predicted in the book of Mormon. He said, Hey, the Gentiles are going to be a scourge unto my people. And, and God saw all this. He sees it happening, but um, never, and it was fulfilled, but, the saints didn't get that. It was after Israel had been driven and scattered by the Gentiles that then the Lord will remember the covenant that he made to Abraham, never mentions Enoch, unto all the house of Israel. So after all this scattering occurs, after the death and destruction of the Holocaust, all these things, then God remembers, then God has mercy on Israel. It's like, so the Gentiles came to a, a spiritual understanding that we rejected through the Book of Mormon at the time when Israel was depressed and depleted and scourged. But Israel is going to use that same record, the Book of Mormon, and they're going to come to a full knowledge of Christ. And at the same time, the Gentiles become defeated and depleted. And, and, this is, and then the Gentiles ha still have an opportunity to repent. But it's not the story we're told and when we assemble at our worship services about, hey, we're looking up in the sky, looking for Enoch City to come down. We miss the whole point of the Book of Mormon if we ascend to that idea. 
So, so it's always been that Israel scattered by the Gentiles and Israel comes back to Christ before Zion comes. So this is where I, I just wanted to, um, let's see, I think I went one too far. I, I just wanted us to read through about 20 verses from Mormon 2, or if you're in the LDS, it starts at Mormon uh, chapter 5, verse 10, because this doesn't speak the word Zion or New Jerusalem, but what it speaks about is Israel's regathering. And it's very important because it's all part of the covenant with Abraham. And if we really want to understand Zion, we'll turn to the covenant with Abraham to see what it's all about. And so I'm just going to read these is on a few pages here, but I just want to read this and come back and talk about a little bit of it. So um, it begins, and now behold, this I speak unto their seed and also to the Gentiles, which have care for the house of Israel, that realize and know from whence their blessings come. For I know that such will sorrow for the calamity of the house of Israel. Yea, they will sorrow for the destruction of this people. They will sorrow that this people had not repented that they might have been clasped in the arms of Jesus. Any times you see good things happening with arms, that's a code word for mercy in Hebrew, that they could have had the mercy of Jesus. Now these things are written under the remnant of the house of Jacob, and they are written after this manner because it is known of God that wickedness will not bring them forth unto them, and they are to be hid up unto the Lord that they may come forth in his own due time. And this is the commandment which I have received. And behold, they shall come forth according to the commandments of the Lord when he shall see fit in his wisdom. So this word is going to come forth to God's people when he sees fit. You know, I've realized this. It humbles me to realize it doesn't matter how good our websites are or how many podcasts we put out. These things are going to reach God's people when he sees fit. You know, we can try our best and we should try our best, but it's, it's all in God's time. And they shall go forth to the unbelieving of the Jews, and for this intent shall they go, that they may be persuaded that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. See, Joseph Smith was never talking about this in his day. None of the people of the church were, they, they all felt like we had to gather to independence to build a temple because Jesus was going to return to it really soon. But, but God had a different plan from the beginning. He's like, no, the Gentiles are going to receive this gospel. You can respond and come to me. But in the end, this gospel, this pure gospel goes back to Israel and they will turn, their hearts will turn and they will respond. And, and then through that, that the father may bring about through his beloved, his great and eternal purpose in the restoring of the Jews or all of the house of Israel to the land of their inheritance, which the Lord their God hath given them unto the fulfilling of his covenant. And also that the seed of his people may more fully believe his gospel, which shall go forth unto them from the Gentiles. For this people shall be scattered in a dark people. I'm going to jump ahead to 46. They were once a delightsome people, and they had Christ for their shepherd. Yea, they were led even by God the Father. But now, behold, they are led about by Satan. I mean, what a contrast. They were led by God, and now they're led by Satan like chaff before the wind or a vessel that's tossed on the waves without sail or anchor or anything wherewith to steer her. Even as she is, so are they. And behold, the Lord hath reserved their blessing, which they might have received in this land for the Gentiles, which shall possess the land. All of our history reflects this. These people dwindled in unbelief. You know, we call them Native Americans or the First Nation people. But the Gentiles overpowered them, and we had inventions, and we built cities, and we overtook the land, and all these things got allowed because of the dwindling of the house of Israel here. But in the end, the, the promise is that the Gentiles reject God, and the word returns to the house of Israel. And this is, this is where it summarizes. And it shall come to pass that they shall be driven and scattered by the Gentiles. And after that, they have been driven and scattered by the Gentiles. Behold, then will the Lord remember the covenant which he hath made unto Abraham, unto all the house of Israel. See, this is very important. And it's hard to think about this, the way it's written, if our minds are clouded with Enoch. Because Enoch distracts us from, from this truth, is that after the scattering of Israel, by the Gentiles, then the Lord remembers his covenant, and his, re his covenant is to regather them, to return them to the lands. The Lord will remember the prayers of the righteous, which he has been put up 
unto him for them. And then, O ye Gentiles, how can you stand before the power of God except you shall repent and turn from your evil ways? This is the judgment that's coming upon the Gentiles. And then he concludes, therefore repent and humble yourselves before him, lest he come out in justice against you, lest a remnant of the seed of Jacob shall go forth among you as a lion and tear you in pieces, and there is none to deliver. See, Mormons emphasizing these words about 400 years after Jesus spoke them. He says, hey, you Israel, you people of Nephi and Lamanites who are righteous, you're going to become righteous again, and you're going to rise up over the Gentiles someday who have put you down. Uh, that's still a day to come. It certainly wasn't in Joseph Smith's day. But kind of looking at the summary of this, we see that Israel has to be persuaded that Jesus is the Christ. And the Father's going to bring about these covenants that he made with Abraham. And in the end, they're going to be driven by the Gentiles. But after that, he's going to remember his promise. And then the Gentiles are scrutinized, condemned, judged, whatever. It's, it's not a pretty sight. None of that comes into this Enoch story, we're told. Like I said, it distracts us. It pulls us away. This is, this is what builds up to Zion. This is what builds up to the end of 3 Nephi 9 in the earliest version of the Book of Mormon that begins 3 Nephi 10, where the work commences when Jesus is in our midst and the word goes out to the remnant and to, you know, to Israel and gathers them in. There's no Enoch city that comes down. Jesus is here. The power of heaven comes down. But it's not the story we've been telling. And that's the sad thing. So some of these other scriptures, you know, again, I think I think we already talked about this, that God would pour out his spirit on the Gentiles, that we'd be a scourge to the people of this land. But but because we haven't read the Book of Mormon or understood it, we, we come up with these incorrect assumptions. Like the early saints... Is, <clears throat> assumed that Israel was gathering right behind them. But the Book of Mormon teaches, no, there's a process. The unbelieving of the Jews have to turn to Jesus. And then they turn to the Book of Mormon. Um, and we see that beginning in Israel right now. We see the work of like one for Israel to single out one of the groups there. They are converting people to Christ and it's a pure conversion. They're not converting them to traditions of man. They're, they're preparing their hearts to realize that Jesus was this infinite sacrifice made for them. And people are accepting that. The, the Book of Mormon truth will come eventually, but their hearts are changing and it's happening right now. But we're so caught up in our own world, I don't think we can see out of it sometimes to realize what God is doing right now in our day. Hey, Corey, you had a yeah. um, video at one time and I was in a conversation the other day and I couldn't remember if it was the Psalms or another book of scripture, but do you remember when the one for Israel group went out on the street and we're just having was, a microphone? Isaiah 53. Yeah. Uh -huh. Isaiah. Okay. I thought it was, so there's a chapter in Isaiah, right? 53. That's pretty specific about Jesus. Well, and, and there's history there among the Jews that was called the forbidden chapter because some of the Jewish old testaments didn't even include it. It had been removed by the rabbis because they couldn't explain it. And other rabbis explained it away, but none of them could bear to say it was actually pointing to a man, you know, Jesus. Uh, but that's that's really significant. And when people read this, they're astounded because some of them have never heard those words before. You know, it's, it's talking about he was wounded for our transgressions, you know, by his stripes we are healed. That's the verses that are mentioned. Uh, yeah. So gift right over in the in the Old Testament readings. Right. So they would read that then to people on the street and have a conversation, say, well, do, who does this sound like? And they, the people hearing it for the first time, like, well, that, that would fit Jesus. But by and large, they were ignorant of that fact because just, you know, plain and precious truths removed from their word as well. Yep. And, and again, all of scripture is to bring us to salvation and salvation only comes through Christ. Even this whole story of Zion and Enoch, it's not a separate conversation. It's all to bring Israel back to Christ so they can find salvation in him and through him and because of him. That's ultimately the bottom line to all of this. Um, it just doesn't fit with the, it, it, even though, and one of our listeners wrote in and said, kind of objectingly, but I think she said, yeah, but the story of Enoch has brought me so much comfort my whole life. You know, we, we hold hope. Yeah. Hope. Yeah. <clears throat> hope. 
and and that's again it's like yeah i can i can see that i can understand that but that's what tradition does you know we hope hope for things because of what we've heard and the book of mormon gives a greater hope it's it's a hope that sometimes we don't even know exists and and that's where i would say to put your focus it's also i think there's a difference between a, a personal hope and a collective hope as a body of people and so you you may have a, a hope in this idea of living safely in a place where there's no crime and plenty of you no know, poor and plenty of food for everybody uh and jesus is there i mean that can provide personal hope but when the story gets corrupted and the plain truth and message of being able to be healed and saved by the atonement of Christ is kind of blanketed by a lot of extra stuff such as Zion and Enoch and things. Um, as a body, I think it does damage as a corporation. And so I say, well, where where is our hope been found as far as a church thriving, coming together, operating under the spirit and spiritual gifts of Jesus Christ? Uh, most of us would say that's done nothing but decrease and almost completely disappear in the church so i think maybe on a personal level it makes you feel comfortable and hopeful but as a body of people i think there's not a lot of hope there that we're gonna get things straightened and on the right tracks until christ does it himself so i think it's it's not so hopeful i think as a body of people when we embrace false tradition agreed agreed well, the promise of the Book of Mormon has always been that when the Gentiles reject these things, he's going to bring the fullness of the gospel from among them, and he's going to bring it back to Israel. That's 3 Nephi 7, or it's 3 Nephi 16 in the LDS. And this is telling because we we apparently never read these scriptures either. And again, I don't know. There's just so much, and it's like I just want to just push it all aside and just say I just want to learn what the Book of Mormon says because there's so many other ideas and so many little influences that get in and it just cause us to look a little bit off target. And and I don't want any of that. You know, I just I don't want hope in something that's false. I, I want hope in what's true, even if it's hard, even if it doesn't give me a rosy feeling. I'd rather just know the truth. So in. You know, I'm I'm yeah. amazed. I'm amazed how the message of the Book of Mormon, you know, it's like these writers, they're all they're all focused on the same thing. You know, they're all focusing on Christ, they're all focusing on waking the Gentiles up and calling us to repentance. And so what you're what you're reading right here out of Third Nephi and that in the previous one you're reading. Um, this morning I was reading uh in in Ether, uh chapter one, and it, it you know, again, like you said, you know, we read things and, you know, it's like we're reading them for the first time, you know, I mean, obviously I've read it before, but it just, just hit me different this time. Um, and this is kind of, uh, this is going along with everything you're saying here. So Moroni is telling us the story of Jared, brother Jared and all that. And then he sort of pauses in the middle of his thing and sa and just starts talking to, uh, to us. And he says, uh, and so it's like, he's like, puts in a little commentary and he says, uh, this is in verse, starting in verse 30 in the RLDS. And he had sworn in his wrath unto the brother of Jared that whosoever should possess this land of promise from that time henceforth and forever should serve him, the true and only God, or they should be swept off when the fullness of his wrath should come upon them. And now we can behold the decrees of God concerning this land, that it is a land of promise, and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall serve God, or they shall be swept off when the fullness of his wrath shall come upon them. And the fullness of his wrath cometh upon them when they are ripened in iniquity. For behold, this is a land which is choice above all other lands. Wherefore, he that doth possess it shall serve God or shall be swept off. For it is the everlasting decrees of God. And it is not until the fullness of the of iniquity among the children of the land that they are swept off. And we've, of course, we've seen that repeat itself with both the Jaredites and the, and the Lamb Nephites. Uh, and this cometh unto you, O ye Gentiles. And now he starts talking to us. Mm -hmm. And this cometh unto you, O ye Gentiles, that ye may know the decrees of God, that ye may repent and not continue in your iniquities until the fullness come, that ye may not bring down the fullness of the wrath of God upon you as the inhabitants of the land hath hitherto done. Behold, this is a choice land, and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall be free from bondage and from captivity and from all other nations under heaven, if they will but serve the God of the land, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. Which, which hath been manifested by the things which we have written. 
That is so specific. I wish Shane, yeah, on your wall back there, you have an on-air sign. I, I, I think you need to add a warning sign and just when we read certain things, just have it start flashing like, "Hey, inhabitants of the United States." <laughs> this <laughs> is right. That's. I mean, how much more plain can you get? And 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 so many years ago, Moroni is like, man, this this guy that ties up this entire project and buries it and and is preserved by the hand of God is giving us a specific warning like wake up you know you guys living in the u.s you've had a chance to have the gospel wake up warning you know he's done it before and so it's going to happen again yeah and, yeah. It, and it comes back to how you ended that that verse shane that jesus christ is god is the god of the land and it's that's probably in the restoration like the more staunch restoration groups that seems to be the issue they object to the most you can't read that out of the Book of Mormon to them without someone becoming shaking mad, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's because of our traditions that we've been taught incorrectly. Right. Well, um, I, I had some slides. I don't know they're really important to dwell on, but, you know, there's some notions, uh, just a couple of them that are in the restoration that kind of go against this, the Book of Mormon teaching, like, the restoration sort of teaches that, okay, all of us good people are going to be gathered in one spot. We kind of get that out of order because um, it's not mentioned in the Book of Mormon. What is mentioned is that when, you know, at this time before Zion's established, that there's the bad is on the earth, but that God's church, the church of the Lamb is there, and its numbers were few because of the whore that sat upon many waters. Nevertheless, I beheld that the church of the Lamb of God, which were the saints of God, were also upon all the face of the earth. Now that tells me that they're not all just gathered to Independence, Missouri. People can argue that if they want, but it seems to imply something different. You know, we've also, because of our traditions, we get into mindsets and we get into reasoning and we get into false reasoning, you know, that, I mean, it, I don't, don't want to name names, but some people have implied that, you know, it's, it's not just, the restoration now it's not just the rlds people it's like specific congregations they're the ones who are going to be saved you know there's people that think this and they get down this handful of people that they deem in their own wisdom are capable of being saved because they follow these traditions we're teaching but jesus implies that no god's people are going to be across all the face of the earth and that to me tells a totally different story than what we teach but their dominion on the earth was small because of the wickedness of the great whore that I saw. So that's that's a little different mindset. The one that God's people are still going to be everywhere and not necessarily just gathered in one place. Um, you know, en Enoch City was once on the earth. That's what the restoration sort of teaches. But it's not mentioned in the Book of Mormon. What is, you know, there were opportunities to share it, like when same chapter, Ether 2, when they rejected the words of ether, he saw that when the water receded off the land, it became a choice land above all other lands. Well, why didn't he insert there that because Enoch City was here and it was holy? He never does. There's there's an opportunity there, but it was missed if it ever existed. Um, you know, Lehi, Moroni, ether, they all mention part of the creation, but no one ever mentions this heavenly city Enoch being on the earth. Uh, the Book of Mormon teaches instead this covenant with Abraham. And, and that is really, I mean, that's kind of what I wanted to say is that it's just not an Enoch story at all. It's always about Abraham. There are several chapters and verses that do discuss Abraham. I, I loved how you summed it up sometime back, Shane, with talking about the covenant with Abraham and how you know the animals' bodies were parted and, and God literally walks through and says, hey, you know, the person... Who breaks this covenant is going to die if they break it <clears throat> but god literally died in the flesh to make the covenant you know there's an interesting symbolism there but we read about it in genesis we read about it in the old testament like here in chronicles we read about this covenant with abraham in the book of acts um but here and this is really the only other thing i'm going to share is that um but jeremiah comes back to this and at the time when Israel is suffering in the Babylonian captivity or just about to. Jeremiah seems to look far into the future 
And he says, I'm going to gather them out of the countries where I've driven them in my anger. And so everyone local in Jerusalem is probably thinking, oh, yeah, we're going to go to Babylon, but we'll come back. He said, I'm going to bring them again to this place. I'm going to cause them to dwell safely. They shall be my people. I will be their God. But notice he says, I'll make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts and they shall not depart from me. See, Israel departed from God again, even worse, you know, when Jesus came, his crucifixion. So this promise was at the end, for the end times, I'll rejoice over them. I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and my whole soul. For thus saith the Lord, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, so will I bring upon them all the good that I've promised them. So that's the promise that God made with Israel. And it's expounded by the Book of Mormon. And it, it clarifies, I think, where our focus should be, what our hope should be in. So there's other scriptures. We've actually touched on some of these before. But th this is just the Book of Mormon mentioning the covenants made with uh, Abraham, and how it's the fulfillment of those that brings our ultimate blessing. It's the fulfillment of the covenants with Abraham that brings us back to God. So um, I'm not going to read through all these, but just to mention that in the end, <clears throat> the end of the covenant with Israel, with the Gentiles, with everyone is eternal salvation. That's what his goal has always been, to bring our, as the doctrine and covenant says, to bring to pass our immortality and eternal life. That's true. Uh, how it's done is differently than what we've taught, but that is true. So um, that's really all I wanted to say about all this stuff. I would encourage everyone to remember the Book of Mormon and study it first in, in your pursuit of this knowledge. So let me ask you guys, what is, if you could just sum up, what's been the problem with um, using the story of Enoch in the, in the Genesis of the inspired version or the Joseph Smith translation or some sections in the doctrine and covenants, what, um, what has it done that's been bad in the restoration to just put it that way? How has it hindered us? How has it hurt us? Cause people will say, what's the big deal, whether you're looking forward to Zion or Jesus returning, isn't it all the same thing? And I could go first if you <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Obviously, I thought about that in my mind. But um, so I think one of the things that is evident is that when Genesis in the inspired version or Joseph Smith's translation has been um, has been used as part of our canon of scripture, that you start getting things tied in such as mysteries and keys and you have this church of the firstborn that's mentioned in genesis that's really not a, a thing so much but it becomes a thing in our culture here's just a, a, a pull this up here this is a doctrine and covenants um i think it's section 104 in the rlds but it says so here we start seeing how we start attaching other things to this idea of unique it says the power and authority of the higher or melchizedek priesthood is to hold the keys of all the spiritual blessings of the church to have the privilege of receiving the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven and to have the heavens opened unto them to commune with the general assembly and church of the firstborn and there's right out of um genesis you know when yep. the general assembly of the church of the firstborn shall come down out of heaven and possess the earth and have place until the end comes and so we have like this ability, the Melchizedek priesthood has the authority to get the spiritual blessings, to hold the keys of all spiritual blessings of the church, right? To have the privilege, the privilege of receiving the mysteries of the kingdom, to have the heavens open unto them, communion with the church of the firstborn, and to have communion and presence of God the Father and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. That is a huge, huge um, claim for the Melchizedek priesthood. My first first question would be, Corey, as an as a elder or Shane, what do you think about this communing with the church of the firstborn as your right and your key to this mystery? I, I don't see it that way. I just... <laughs> or how many, I should say, how many of our Melchizedek priesthood members or on the LDS side, they would say they're, they're apostles or they're prophets who are considered prophets how many of them have had this experience or have shared this experience 
in public of communing with the church of the firstborn and God, the father and Jesus. It's uh, and we say, well, that's, I mean, we say, is this pertinent today? Well, uh, you know, even within the last year or two, I've got a copy of email sent out to the restoration branches at large with a reminder of the ones in charge. Hey, remember, we have the keys to all spiritual blessings of the church. And they're asking for support as they as they make their pilgrimage to Kirtland to receive the word of God and to worship God. And to say that this isn't affecting our culture uh, yeah. would, would just be a huge and in, in, incorrect statement. It's absolutely a part of everything we believe in. It's saved for another conversation, but a whole nother realm of this Enoch story is the same time period as when this Melchizedek priesthood came in. Melchizedek priesthood is part of Freemasonry as well. And maybe a lot of guys in the restoration didn't know that, but that's an emphasis in Freemasonry, this Melchizedek. And it's even debatable. I mean, the book, the book of Mormon never mentions Melchizedek priesthood. It mentions Melchizedek. But I, I use that for another example of how the Book of Mormon is the standard. Um, there's a lot of things that are misused here, too, like this Church of the Firstborn. Again, that's Jesus. And so it doesn't even make sense. The Church of the Firstborn, to enjoy the communion of the presence of God, the Father, and Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, you just mentioned Jesus. I mean, if you get the wording right, the church of the firstborn, but it's not. They act like it's this church of early people. Anyhow, there's so many things that don't fit right here. I just, I can't even hold it as, as truth. And well, this is effective, I think, twofold. Number one, the men who are called to this office now feel a responsibility to go to God and to receive his mind and will and to bask in his presence and then bring that that instruction back to the people because they're mm -hmm. the ones that hold that keys i think and and then on the flip side the people have a learned response that we look to our leaders to go to god and to have this special authority this special key um, and it's held over us all the time we're reminded of it in emails and gatherings um and that our kind of our success hinges on how spiritual we are in order to maintain this connection to heaven through our mm -hmm. our ministers and hey, can, can you bring up Psalm 110, verse 4, uh, if if you don't mind? Because sure. and I think you can do it either King James or Inspired Version. But the point is that this is where, um, I, th I think this is it, Psalm 110, it's, it's verse 4. 110? Yeah. Uh, the Lord yeah. has sworn and will not repent. Right. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Well, this is a classic verse that our people would look at and argue, say, well, no, there's an order of Melchizedek. This verse outside of the restoration, you know, before the restoration existed, was argued for centuries that the scribes inserted this by theologians who don't know anything about Joseph Smith or didn't then. It's been debated forever that this verse did not exist in the original canon of scripture and it was added later. By whom? We don't know. But sometime even after the days of Jesus, it was put back in the Old Testament because someone wanted to try to prove a point. I I agree with those people. I mean, it's like I don't look to the scribes for firsthand knowledge, but it's just interesting that this verse right here is debated around the world in theological circles that it's somehow not part of the original scripture. And that shocks people. But again, we we're already told that the Bible had faults. Our problem as the restoration is that we didn't know the difference. And so we held on to these things too. And now we've got this whole division of priesthood called the Melchizedek priesthood that the Book of Mormon never touches. The Book of Mormon only calls priesthood after the order of God. And, and it's a simple priesthood. It's a humble priesthood. Uh, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that the Doctrine and Covenants puts to it. The priesthood of those days didn't spend their time in meetings and quorums voting you know, the way that they did all through our church history. And a different priesthood uh, post Jesus atonement than private than previous. As a matter of fact, we've taken the word priesthood and we've, we've pulled it out of the old Testament, brought it over into the new Testament and thrown a bunch of mixture of everything at it. And it's become its own, its own entity. But getting back to the scriptures, it wasn't even uh, a, a thing. And Christ never really even used that word or, or made it a issue of his teaching about the kingdom of heaven. Yep. That's basically exactly. the oh. go ahead, Shane. Yeah, I I think that's probably our biggest issue is is our redefinition of all these terms. 
you know, if I if I say gathering or I say Melchizedek or I say priesthood or I say authority, you know, we we immediately have a thing come into our mind. It's sort of built into our DNA, you know. Um, and I think the I think you were when, like early the question that you asked previously. I was I've been thinking about it, and you know, I think the real core issue here is pride. Um, yes. and, and because of pride, we, we feel entitled. We want to be special. We want to be better than everybody else. We want to have this higher level in, 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 in heaven. Yeah. I want to have these extra keys or whatever. You know, you think about what authority actually is authority at its, in its basic, basic form is just power. You know, it's, it's authority is the power of God within you. If I'm, if the Lord is influencing something I'm saying, then I'm operating with authority. And as soon as that is gone, then I no longer have that authority. It's not like I'm knighted, you know, within, you know, as some title, you know, and, and that's, but we, we hear authority and we think, okay, you've now forever, you know, you are now this, you are now this office of priesthood and you carry all these keys and all that. Well, you know, so in my job recently, I got a promotion and I have, I have nine people that work underneath me and, you know, and that's kind of a first for me. And so now I have authority at my job. I, I have I'd have true power over their lives. I can make their life miserable at work. I can help them be successful in their career. I mean, I could go either direction and that's, that is authority. That's power, you know, and God, God's structure with man is not hierarchical. You know, it's not a top down structure. It's Christ who is God who came among us and died for our sins. And then all the rest of us, (laughs) there's no, there's no levels. There's no, pecking order. And I think we as human beings, we we want that. We want to be more important than our neighbor. And I think that is the driving force that allows us to both create and embrace these kind of doctrines. Um, so I, in answer to your question about being a, an elder, a title of an elder, I'm just a servant of God. And, and I, hopefully I'm a servant of God every day. You know, I need to be on my knees doing that. So we can call it whatever we want. But if the Lord inspires me to do something, then maybe in that moment I am technically what you would call an elder or what a priest or, or priesthood or whatever you want to call it. But really it just comes down to, am I prepared to serve him? Is my heart right? Am I, am I humble? Am I, and if I'm not, then that means I'm following tradition and I'm taking glory unto myself and I'm seeking the, you know, the praise of men. You know, and that's really it. That's, that's the two churches that the scripture, that the Book of Mormon talks about. You know, there's only yeah. two churches. And we've made it so complicated with all these keys and authority and titles and offices and all this stuff that we've just made it so confusing. And then we start pulling in all these scriptures that have been added or added, you know, after the fact. And then now we're even, you know, people are pulling in, you know, old documents and old sermons from people that they respect, Arthur Oakman, all these kind of people from the past. And we've kind of built this sort of creature and the church has kind of taken on a, a life of its own, you know. Um, in, in other words, it's it's like it's an it's its own entity that's living and breathing, and and we must be converted to it, and we must support it, and we must believe it. And you know, there was a, a lady that I've been talking to, Mike and I have been talking to, uh, um, that is a is LDS, and she's been awakening. She, she's been realizing that her traditions were are not from the Lord, and. But her husband's not with her on that on that journey, unfortunately. And but one of the things that he had told her was that she, you know, she was taking and and she was like living in an anti-Mormon way or taking, I, I forgot the wording, but basically saying, you know, you're just you're operating against the church. And it's like the church it, it should not be a thing. It should not be a living, breathing organism. The the church is just simply the people that are following Christ. And that's it. You know, but we've turned it into this sort of, I don't know, it's like its own planet that has gravity that, you know, that we must be supportive of. And if we're not, if we're not, then we're apostate and we're cast out, you know, and it's, it's sad to see what's happened over time. You got something pulled up here, Corey? Yeah. Just following on what Shane just said, he used this word because of pride. And this is interesting. This is from second Nephi 12 and it's Nephi's writings. Many would teach after these vain and foolish doctrines and seek to hide their counsels from the Lord. Works would be in the dark. And notice, and and the the punctuation of this is incorrect, but it should say, yea, they have all gone out of the way. They have all become corrupted because of pride. 
And because of false teachers and false doctrines, their churches have become corrupted and their churches are lifted up because of pride. They are puffed up. You said th there's a parallelism that's lost because of the punctuation, but three different times it mentions what you just said. And it's talking about us in our day that rob the poor because of our sanctuaries, rob the court poor for our fine clothing, persecute the meek because we're puffed up and wear stiff necks and high heads. And because of pride and wickedness and abominations, they've all gone astray. You know, save it be who are the humble followers of Christ. And notice here, even the humble followers, nevertheless, they are led that in many instances they err because they're taught by the precepts of men. I mean, it's just, I think what you just said nailed it. Corey, I'm mindful of time because I know you have responsibilities. So to sum up what I think you've taught this, this tale of two Zions, this tale in the scriptures, in the Book of Mormon, really, and what I see is our people, what we do often is when Zion's mentioned, we take that out of its context and put it onto us because we believe in a Zion. But most often in the Book of Mormon, it's talking about Isaiah uh, and quoting Isaiah, and it was the Zion or the hill or the city, the covenant people. It was a way of life. It was a set of instructions that, that are put upon the, the house of Israel or the right. Jews, Jerusalem, and that the new Jerusalem is mentioned in the Book of Mormon, but only a couple of times. And it's in relation to uh, part of the tribe, which is Joseph and his covenant on this land. And then we have the Zion, the new Jerusalem, of which is mostly just called Zion of the restoration, which we often take in scriptures and sermons and in and, and conversations we pull out scriptures about zion in the old testament and we automatically put them on ourselves and make them pertain to us but the the restoration um really if you take the book of mormon it's not really mentioned a whole lot the idea of the new jerusalem it's not really it's there it's going to happen but the message of the book of mormon is is being changed by christ having your heart changed learning how to offer a sacrifice of a broken heart in a contrite spirit so that his blood can atone for us. And it's all about the promise of eternal life and what Jesus has done for us, his great love. We were asked the other day, what's the fullness of the gospel? And I think the gospel is that we can be saved from our sins by our Savior and because Amen. of what he did. That's just the gospel. And so the fullness of the gospel is when that story is presented in beauty and truth and simplicity and it's fully given to us and i don't know any book that does that better than the book of mormon and so it's to me simply this the enoch and the design of the restoration and the tale of that city just simply blankets the need to come to christ to know him and to be changed and uh, that's evident in how i treat my fellow brothers and sisters if my love for them is growing and that they're becoming more and more equal in my eyes to myself and that I don't lift other people up. And that's the simple message. And I just think, even as I shared that scripture, you know, about the church of the firstborn and how uh, still in our culture, we're still looking to men to go and receive instruction from God. And it's still this big thing about building Zion and the temple and, and independence. And it's really just really self-centered and, and covers the basic message of come to Christ. And that's what the Book of Mormon is. And if we think that that isn't true in the Restoration, I really don't think we're being honest. Because looking back at any one of our histories, what was what were you taught? What was the most you were taught growing up? What did you know about the church? And I would dare to say that it wasn't interpersonal relationship with Jesus, but it's the story of Zion. And I understand those two can be looked at it the same thing, but the reality is, if we're honest, but are they? And I would have to say no. I think one's overshadowed the other, by and large, through our history. Agreed. Yeah, I think the biggest danger in the whole the whole Enoch story is the fact that it puts so much emphasis on what I can do. You know, it's it's about works, and I mean, we don't really we don't say that openly, but. You know, when thy posterity shall look upwards and embrace the truth, then shall Zion look downwards. And if then f formula that starts with me, I have to bring about Zion, mm -hmm. you know, right. and so it, and it, it, that's not a power that I have. The only power that I have is to repent of my sin. The what only power. So. Yeah. 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 The only power is God. And mm -hmm. and so if you if you start putting the, the onus of everything on ourselves, 
then we we're gonna we're just gonna fail. We're just gonna have failure, and Satan's gonna laugh. Well, know? when 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 the scripture when men shall keep all my commandments, then shall Zion again come on the earth. Shane, what are you doing in your life to prevent Zion? Obviously, you're right. not keeping all the commandments because I am, and so it's waiting on you. And so <laughs> right. you see, right? You see the you see the um, who has authority and who's not doing things right, and what do we need to get back to that's right? We have to do all these things perfect so that Zion can come, and it's all about us and and. God's waiting on us, and it's just its a flipping of the story. Um, Zion will come whether Mike Barrett learns how to keep all the commandments or not, right? Um, but that's, or as a group of people, whether we learn to keep all the commandments or not, Zion is appointed and will come, and it's its going to come when things fall into line at God's promise. And, and you have to remember, too, that, that keep all the commandments isn't really the language of the Book of Mormon, and I'm going to get myself into trouble by throwing that out here at the end of the podcast without explaining it but but that's also not what the point was of course we're supposed to keep the commandments but our real point is as shane said we're supposed to turn away from sin and then it's that end of moroni where he says and then the grace of jesus is applied and then god jesus makes you perfect you know he he allows that change his change to take place in us that's how we live and abide in him but the whole other oh we have to keep all the commandments has created this works idea that is incorrect in the in the um, the true doctrine of Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Corey, for coming back well, and you. bringing that to us. And um, this tale of two Zions is that all that you have in your in your idea of? Yeah, I think good? we've we've hit it pretty well, and I uh, appreciate everyone sticking around and listening to it. Well, I do uh, plan on doing another episode uh, where we focus just on the idea of a temple in Zion and find out because we see, the, you know, so obvious in the LDS history and even ours that there's some things there. So we'll look at that probably as a final piece to the tale of two Zions, but I appreciate it. I know you got a responsibility today, so I'll let you go. All righty. Well, thank you guys. And just remember, we are always just walking each other home. Amen. <laughs> Have a good day, brothers. You too. Take care. Bye.